Welcome to The James Huss Show. At The James Huss Show, we explore the intersection of technology, art, and business to uncover new thoughts and opportunities that will help you lead a more fun, fulfilling life and career. Today, we have my friend, Lenworth Gordon. He's a senior technical product manager at Amazon and a teacher at product school. So Lenworth is a product leader with 15 plus years of experience leading global product and innovation teams to develop all new verticals that dynamically advance business growth. A Verizon alum who led negotiations with Google to become the exclusive launch partner for Google's Chromebook and Chrome OS, Lenworth designs product strategies, trials, launch plans, pricing, and commercial deployment across every initiative. Today, he is a leader and educator at Amazon and the product school, guiding multidisciplinary teams and all stakeholders to motivate quick expansion of goals, solution through challenges, and transform product diagrams for global utilization and maximum customer success. Also, I met Lenworth when I took product school. How long ago was that? Probably three years ago, four years ago? At least. At least. A while. Yeah. (laughs) A while ago. And speaking of product school, I want to touch on probably the most important thing you ever told me in product school, I need to follow up on this because it's the number one piece of advice you gave me. And I, I, I'm pretty embarrassed. I never followed through on it. And uh, that is, is the Griddle Cafe still open in Los Angeles? And are the pancakes still as good as you told me in the class? That is a great question. I do know they closed at the beginning of the pandemic, which was tragic. I don't know if they reopened. So we'll, we'll have to research that together. How's yeah? How's COVID in Los Angeles? Because I left a year ago, and it was pretty bad. Uh, not not only just the cases, but the uh, like a lot of those businesses, like those cafes and everything, closed down. Are are you starting to see some of the stuff open up, or like what, what's the situation like over there? Stuff is pretty open, but you know we're in this weird Omicron kind of kind of made us reset. So. Uh, the businesses haven't closed. You can still eat at restaurants and everything, but like schools and things like that are uh, vigilantly testing students and um, really trying to manage that and sending out test kits and things like that. Um, but just, you know, from a local standpoint, Los Angeles is a great place for a pandemic because there's so many outdoor yeah. things to do. So you can still cycle and surf and golf and all that cool stuff. So. It's not that bad. <laughs> yeah, that was I was good too. I was lucky because I was living in a big house with like four four other four other guys. And at the beginning I was like, mm, it's kind of far away from where I work. Is it worth the commute? And then afterwards <laughs> I was like, Oh, that was a that was a good call. So can you are you still you're still working at Amazon, right? And are you still yes. working on the sidewalk project? Correct. Yes. Can you explain what like the side pro- walk project is and what kind of what yeah what you do for it? Sure. So sidewalk is, is pretty unique invention with sidewalk uh, with Amazon, where it is a community powered network, kind of a crowdsource network where we take our millions of existing Amazon devices and Ring devices like your floodlight cameras and spotlight cameras, doorbells. Amazon Echoes, um, and we have them radiate a radio signal that makes a 900 megahertz, which is a long range, um, low power uh, network, IoT network. So it's not for high bandwidth applications like sound or video or streaming, anything like that, but for traditional IoT applications like just monitoring something tracking the location of something uh, or controlling something remotely. So, um, you know, with those existing devices, it automatically made a nationwide network for, for Amazon. So, um, and, you know, it of course gives our customers a lot of advantages because now they can use their IOT devices, their smart devices outside of the home. And and to answer your other question, I'm the product manager for Sidewalk Network. So in terms of requirements and roadmaps and, um, you know, pretty much anything to do with that project, uh, I'm I'm the throat to choke, so to speak. (laughs) I'm the the product owner. 
Yeah. So it's almost like the main problem. I think it's the main problem. I think it's solving is when a delivery person is walking up to your door. There's like this uncanny valley of sometimes there's kind of, there's kind of like some Wi-Fi. There's sometimes there's Zeta, sometimes there's Wi-Fi, but there's like sometimes there's no internet just for that little walk. And so sure. it's about it's almost like it's shortening the amount of time it takes to notify a customer uh, when they get uh, when they get a package. Well, I mean, even beyond that, let's just outside of your home altogether. Let's say. So one of the first products we announced that we're going to launch um, very shortly is a dog tracker. So yes, it could track your dog while it's on your property, but now you'll get an alert if it leaves your property. So you'll know exactly when your dog breached the geofence, we call it, and then you'll even be able to see it as a dot on the map uh, as it's running through the neighborhood <laughs> wreaking havoc. And um, you know, then you can track it down easier. So. Um, yeah, we're, we're talking the whole residential area, far beyond the home. That's it's kind of amazing how much for like n for non technical people. As an engineer, I'm just thinking how hard that actually is <laughs> to like yeah. to not only not only from a technical side, but all the different teams you have to talk to at Amazon to agree to do stuff. Uh, oh yeah. For example, <laughs> I'm like like what what's that? side is like because i know a lot of people they start uh wanting to get into engineering want to code then they learn how to code and they get in and they realize oh coding was pretty hard but getting mm -hmm. steven to like uh let us like integrate with his amazon thing over there or getting jessica <laughs> to let uh to like uh to like finish a design for something even though she's not directly reporting you and you don't you don't really have any like authority title. That's honestly, I think that's harder. <laughs> like at, it is uh, going from there. So, what's what's that like? How do you like? How many different teams are you interfacing with, give or take, on like a given week? And what are some way like? What are some ways of using that like soft? What are some strategies you use to get soft influence uh, from other teams? Excellent question. So um, the ruling without direct authority or formal authority is a product manager's like number one skill, number one soft skill. Uh, you have to get people to excited enough about your project to actually spend some of their time to uh, work on it. So you have to come with facts, data, and some charisma. <laughs> um, you have to understand what that stakeholder's goals are, what they find important, um, and what matters to them. And then talk to that, talk that language when you're asking for help. So if I'm talking to finance, um, talking about how much money this is going to make us as, as a company, <laughs> I'm talking to engineering, I'm talking about all the cool technologies it's going to use and uh, how, how quickly we can get this done using some available technologies and um, how only a certain amount of headcount will be able to get this done <laughs> and it won't disrupt all their other goals that they have. And we, when I'm talking to the lawyers, I'm talking about how secure and safe and um, how much privacy this has. Um, when I'm talking to marketing, I'm talking about how easy this will be to message to customers and how easy it will be for them to understand and how excited they'll be about it and why they want to why they want to want to buy it and how they'll that'll make their lives better and. Um, add value and all that good stuff. So depending on who you're talking to, you have to speak their language to get them excited about uh, helping you. And then you can always lean back on, this is what our <laughs> CEO this, or this president. This is what Jeff said. <laughs> this is what Jeff said. <laughs> exactly. Um, so wh whatever works for the stakeholder that you're talking to, you need to learn how to speak their language. And um, 
and yeah, I can't, I, even though I own the product, I can't do anything without all those people I just mentioned, nothing gets got done. So it's all about coordinating and facilitating those people getting their work done and just removing roadblocks and letting them do their thing. I think it's, it's funny too, because anyone who hasn't been in any sort of management position, whether that's like a more traditional manager with direct reports or a product manager, I think everyone in their head, they think, oh, if, if I was the boss, I would right. do, I would just do this. I would just do that. I would just tell so-and-so to do that. And then at least I experienced this when I, I was engineering manager. Even if they report to you, it doesn't mean they'll do what you say. And if they do what you say, like, so I remember once I was talking to, because I became like a tech lead by accident at a previous job and I was talking to my manager. And I said something similar. I'm like, it's really hard to get people to do stuff when they don't report to you. And I'll never forget what he said. He said, just wait until your manager and they do report to you. And when you ask them to do something, they just roll their eyes at you and then do a half-assed job. <laughs> he's like, it, he's like, it doesn't get any easier. And then I remember being there and just like uh, talking to an engineer on the team and just basically just <laughs> like <laughs> pleading, like saying, we just need to make the button blue. Like, I know, like, I know you want to, I know you want to implement this whole new test framework, but like, we have a live event in two days and right. we, can we make the button blue today? And then <laughs> set up all the testing and everything else around that over the next week, please. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah. It's tricky too, but yeah, it's because everyone only, like you said, the lawyers only see this side of things. The, uh, That's right. Marketing team only sees that. Sales only sees sales. Right. Engineering only sees that. So being having the role, having the product role is super important because you need at least one person like looking at it all and mm -hmm. being able to explain to everyone like, yeah, this isn't ideal. I know. Right. Right. <laughs> or like, uh, like uh, JS knows this isn't ideal either on on like the marketing side and jessica yeah. knows on engineering this isn't ideal either but like can we we just need to go one step further like that's every right. day that's right yeah yeah you got to be a motivator so it, and an evangelist <laughs> for your product yeah. yeah so it looks like you start you started out as a software engineer mm -hmm. and especially nowadays you see a lot of people uh trying to get into coding a lot of interest in learning how to code and switching careers from something else into engineering. I'm actually uh, I'm actually buddies with somebody in Taipei who's starting like a Thai, Taiwan code camp, uh, like engineering boot camp too. And I'm meeting a lot of people who want to get into engineering. So, and then from there, it looks like you went into project management and then program management and technical services. Can you kind of just walk through um, how you went from engineering to these different roles? what you liked about these different roles and like what kind of led you to product management and what uh, inspired you to switch out of engineering in the first place? Well, I, I gotta say, I wouldn't change a thing. Um, what makes me effective as a product manager working at a tech company is my background in engineering. So, um, yeah, it's easy to say that now as a product manager, I like inventing things and, you know, coming up with the requirements for it and how it's going to be sold and priced and, you know, just kind of building a mini startup, right? And getting people to love it. But if I didn't have the technical background on how it's built, I wouldn't even know it's possible to build. So I want to change a thing. And I think engineering is a tech tech is my passion. And I have curiosity and want to know how things work and want to build things. So that that didn't change. But so I, I liked starting that way and having some things that I built in my portfolio. Um, now, after having done that, you just want to scale. So I can only build so many things <laughs> myself. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so that's where I kind of moved into. Um, and, and 
it was similar to an engineering manager because I, I was doing professional services. So I was building custom applications for clients, kind of the one-off custom applications mm -hmm. or taking an existing software package and customizing it for someone. So it was similar to an engineering manager where the, the consulting I would do, I would lead a team of engineers to build this customization. So I, I like the engineering manager, but I, I went the project route, consultation route. Um, so yeah, just to scale, I want to build bigger things. So I need a team. So I have to lead that team so I can mentor them on use this code, use this tech stack, use this technology and build it. Um, and project, you know, I'm, I'm a bit older. Product wasn't big back then. So that, that was kind of the next step. <laughs> Uh, Don't worry. I, there was no product management when I started either. It yeah, was all yeah. like, uh, they're all called like analysts. Yeah, Is yeah. Like, like, like a, a business project, analyst. Project manager. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Kind of figuring out the market, figuring out what customers want and writing requirements. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I would do that. It was exciting. The cool thing about project and program management is doing a whole bunch of different things for a bunch of different industries. So I got experience in finance and uh, insurance and banking and um, healthcare, uh, transportation, a whole bunch of different things, all these different projects. So that was cool. And I was like, I want more input on what we're actually building. I don't want to just execute. <laughs> I want to actually mm. invent. <laughs> so that that's when as a project manager, I was working side by side with product managers that were providing the requirements and doing all the market research. So I was like, Oh, that looks cool. Let me, let me find a mentor. Let's, that's a product manager. Yeah. And figure out what he's doing and he offer my services and say, you know, can I write that PRD for you? That requirements document? Can I write that roadmap? And then, you know, applied for the product and love it. So, so I like what you mentioned right there. Um, Okay, that that ties into another question I was going to ask, but uh, you found somebody you were in a you were in some role you wanted to do something else, right? And so you found someone who's doing that thing, and you asked asked them if you want if you wanted that if they wanted someone to do the thing for them. That's right. <laughs> they, they wanted help, and I did something similar. I remember the way like I became like an accidental lead engineer at System One was I was on a team with a product manager and all the engineers used to complain about this product manager is like because like oh he never writes anything down he always sh shoots by the seat of his pants mm -hmm. and so i just started writing things down for the product guy right <laughs> like i right. just did the project manager myself it took like an extra 45 minutes a week like it was yeah it was yeah. it was really like to me and my pers my my personality type, my skill set, and like I'm I'm a very organized person. To me, it was just like a no no brainer. Right. And I remember the product manager I worked with was like, "Oh, James, you're the best. You're the best engineer I've ever worked with." Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was, right. I was right. Just like <laughs> writing stuff down. Uh, but what that idea of figuring out what you want to do and then finding someone and then offering to basically work for free. You hear right. that advice in like entrepreneurial context a lot, mm -hmm. but I think a lot of people forget is like a big company like Amazon or Verizon or even System One had 300 employees, which is nothing compared to Amazon. But any co big company past like 100 people, you can kind of have that entrepreneur mindset of like, like let me help, let me work for free, but you still get paid salary. <laughs> so sure. it's, That's right. It's mm -hmm. like you're working for free, like technically... I was doing something that quote unquote wasn't my job, mm -hmm. but it was like an like an insignificant amount of extra time. Like I still did it within the same forty hours anyway. <laughs> and so it's uh, I think a lot of people look at two different yeah. extremes. They look like I got to be entrepreneur and like bet the whole farm and eat ramen noodles and blah blah that side, or oh don't just stay be a cog in the machine the the man will never reward you if you do more than the bare minimum so just do the absolute bare minimum people forget like there's there's an in-between where it's like you can do stuff you you like that other people don't like and then move over there uh 
Was that kind of like your general strategy for switching to these different roles or did you use other strategies? Absolutely. Absolutely. You um, and anyone that asked me how to get into product, I give them the same advice. Um, offer up your services and it's a win-win. They'll be more than happy <laughs> for you to do the work for them. And you get the experience and you, you put it on your resume and you can prove it. You can talk up, talk about what you actually delivered and you can walk people through it because you you did it, you know. You're, you're doing two and jobs. That's another thing I noticed too. Yeah. Like uh, when you're doing the interviews, uh, the engineering, when I was, when I applied for engineering, engineering interviews, the main way they interview nowadays is they ask like a technical question and you have to code in front of them. But when I was doing manager interviews, uh, like you needed, like they could tell if you're, if you're lying about the stories. Because right. when you're interviewing a manager and they ask you a question like, uh, what's the biggest mistake you ever made? You can tell the experienced people because they burst out laughing and like, oh, like this week? Yeah, right, right. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> like this year? And you can kind of go through, it's like, oh, like I had this one conversation and I screwed up really badly and I want to do that again. And I had this hired this one person on the team who I gave the benefit of the doubt to in the interview and they turned out to be bad or yeah. that it, like you get like those stories. Um, you can you can probably kind of lie your way through it, but you can kind of you can usually tell in the interview if they're like completely trying to blow smoke up up your yeah. butter that that experience. Yeah, I mean, I could just tell you from training to interview at Amazon, um, they do a great job on telling you how to peel back the onion in terms of getting details about the story. So you hear the story, okay, nice. Well, tell me exactly what you did or tell me what you did versus your team. Or what was the result of that? And so you, you peel, you dig deeper. So when you dig deeper, it usually reveals if they if they actually did the work or not. So that's a yeah. good point. <laughs> yeah, like it, there's a difference between like, oh, I worked at this company that made the iPhone. Yeah. You're like, yeah. <laughs> okay, but <laughs> <laughs> what, what were you doing there? Oh, I was right. on. Uh, I was. I was on the Apple Watch team. It's like okay, right. like yeah. <laughs> well, what do you do for Apple Watch? Oh, well, my team uh, did uh, all the monitoring and testing. It's like okay, so did you write the test? No. Did you write <laughs> the monitoring? No. Uh, okay, and then you, like four, yeah, right. four questions, exactly. and you're like, oh, you actually. <laughs> You probably you're probably a great human. You're probably really nice. <laughs> That's what le got you this far, but you didn't actually. It's it's tricky. It's easy, and it's easy to feel busy at work, and feel like you're doing stuff. As but you, in reality, you're forwarding emails and right. like right. sending sending Slack messages, uh, which is yeah, it's a easy, very easy trap. Super easy trap to fall into because you feel like you're working, <laughs> but you look back at the end of the week and you didn't actually produce anything. Uh, yeah. A good yeah. example is my roommate. He works for this really, really huge company in Asia that's like a huge conglomerate. There's like two hundred thousand plus people working there, and he told me he's like, oh, he's like the good thing about you, James, is the people on your team they actually have to make stuff because they write code. He's like, right. the people on my team. We don't actually make anything. I'm like, I mean, you don't write like, you don't write a word doc. <laughs> like, there's not a, yeah. like, there's, there must, like, there must be something. It's like, no, we just kind of just send emails to each other. Like, <laughs> I mean, there, there's not there a power. Is there like a PowerPoint slide you have to finish? I'm mean, like, what do you, like, when you start your day, don't you have like a list of things you want to finish by the end of the day? And he's like, oh, not really. It's just like. It's just kind of do whatever. I'm like, oh, oh man, and I've been so I've spent so much time in startup land. <laughs> I just kind of forgot about that. Yeah, even so, while you're either at, they really do nothing, or well, they really do they really don't produce anything, or they don't have a good handle on how to measure success. So, so you need to I know that's the main how. Point. Yeah, you need to know how you're measured, and be able to show your results of that measurement, um, you know, at the end of the year. So um, if, you, if you're not sure on how you're measured, find out. <laughs> so you have a goal. <laughs> to take. Yeah. Yeah. 
oftentimes too, uh, unfortunately, a lot of the t- a lot of how you're measured is how early you show up, especially in Asia, especially Taiwan. Mm. I've noticed uh, it's how early you show up to the office and how late you stay. And mm. as, coming from someone with like a like kind of California style experience, I was like, oh, yeah, <laughs> that's right. <rough. laughs> I went to yeah, I went to a startup event here. And Taipei is doing a really great job trying to promote startups. <clears throat> and uh, one of the one of the people who work for the government is like, "Oh, if you want to be successful at a startup, you gotta work fourteen hour days." And da 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 da. And I'm just like sitting there with my friend, and I was like, my buddy who's done doing a startup with a bunch of his ex Facebook friends, like they're all from Facebook and they're doing a startup right now. Like they're all working like forty two hours a week, thirty five hours a week. Because yeah. they just just do their stuff, like do their stuff, right. <laughs> and then yeah, they don't hard, work, get all work stressed smarter, out. Harder, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> but it's uh, but I've definitely done that. Like when I was twenty one, like uh, the start of I was at, it was we were all just yeah, we all had pulling a b- bunch of hours, but we weren't really getting stuff done. <laughs> but we're all twenty two, twenty one, and so right. it's like. <laughs> like oh this is why you hire adults this, <laughs> it all makes sense right <laughs> so on the uh distributed teams okay do you have to because i remember you mentioned to me you're working with a team out in taipei as well how do you yeah. deal with different stakeholders and different time zones and different schedules and like how, how do you kind of what are some strategies you use to get around that well, you have to, I mean, so, so obviously time zone differences and you have to coordinate that, but from a self-care standpoint and you gotta, you gotta be a firm believer in self-care and not just talk it, uh, working the 80 hour work weeks, is just not healthy. And when you do things unhealthy, you're not productive. So. It's very easy when you're working with global teams. And currently I have uh, Taiwan, um, Ukraine, and, um, you know, just all of U.S. Uh, you, you have to make sure that you don't stay up midnight talking with the Taiwan team and then work all day, <laughs> you know, with the with the West Coast team, etc. You have to consciously um, make make sure you don't don't overwork yourself, but you can be very efficient with it and just do these handoffs. So 5 PM Pacific time, I have a meeting with the Taiwan team and I just lay out a whole bunch of things. We do a sync, you know, this is what got done yesterday. This is what we need done today. This is the direction we need to know, go. And, you know, they're working all night doing my night, what we synced on. And then the next morning I get to see the results of that. So yeah, you just coordinate time zones and make sure you have a nice, clean, well-documented handoff during the window of time that you can meet. So I meet in the morning. I have a UK team too. I meet in the morning with the UK and in the evening with the Asia team. Yeah, I 100%. What I've noticed too, because I had to uh, do a similar thing at the last company I was at. We had people all over the place. Yeah. And uh, at force, it actually went the benefits is it forces you to be organized that's right it forces you to be very organized uh you can get away with a lot of just shoot, shooting from the shooting from your hip uh when everyone's in the same office <laughs> like right <laughs> because you can literally just overhear people talking especially in the open concept office you'll just overhear people talking and uh i noticed yeah with the different time zones in particular it really forced me to figure out, okay, what do I, what do I need to tell so and so? That's right. Before I go to bed, because otherwise, like you said, I'll have to, I'll be on a call at midnight, thinking like, why? That's right. What's what's going on here? Yeah. It forces um, you to be well so organized, the, and you have it forces you to document. You have yeah. To document everything. Yeah. I think the best ideal setup I would want, and I don't know if this is this can exist, would be everyone. Same time zone, same room, but as documented as if you were remote. 
Yeah, that would be the but best of both worlds. <laughs> that would be the best of both worlds. I don't think that exists. <laughs> right. <laughs> I think if I actually had that too, I would instantly like start getting lazy. And so you can't, like it's almost you can't, yeah, you can't I mean, have your cake and eat it too. Yeah, if we sit across from each other, we're not going to be documenting all this these great uh, innovations that we <laughs> talk through on whiteboard. You know, it's just it's going to be lost forever. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, it's, it's tough. <laughs> it's like, oh, let's just we'll just we'll just do this right now, and we'll document the next thing. Right, right. <laughs> well, I don't want to take too much of your time. Thanks so much, Lenworth. It was really great seeing you. Uh, is there anything you want to plug for Amazon or product school or anything at all you want to mention before we head off? Uh, no, I, you know, thank, thank you, James. It's been an honor. Um, everyone out there, take a look at Amazon sidewalk. If you haven't already check it out. Um, you know, it's available on many ring and Amazon devices. It's uh, pretty cool. I'd love to hear what you think. So, shoot me something on LinkedIn. Thank you. I remember I got the, uh, I had the, what's it called? The camera, the ring camera. Is it ring? Yeah. Ring camera. Yeah. Yeah. With the, yeah, cameras, I remember seeing the little sidewalk logo. And I, I took a picture and I sent it to you. Yeah. I'm like, if I have any problems, I'm going to go right to you. <laughs> but look, it worked out perfectly. <laughs> so I didn't have to, I didn't have to, <laughs> I didn't have to pull any relationships to get uh, to get it to work. It worked, like the, the whole side of everything worked great. Thank goodness, awesome. All right, okay. <laughs> See you later. Stay on the call. You. Stay on the call. <laughs> Two <Yep>. clicks. <laughs> Let me double check the tag. Oh man. <laughs>